Hi, welcome to Tech Talks, the People and Planet podcast. On this episode, I'm joined by Ian Wheel, the CEO of AgTech Business Breeder. Hi, Ian. How's it going? Hi, Lee. Yeah, it's good to catch up with you. How are you? I'm okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks for joining us. This one's going to be good. Um, and I wanted to go straight in with the big question. You, you, you guys are in the beef industry, the ag tech industry, but particularly in the beef industry. It divides opinion, right? And I'm, I'm keen to get your stance on it. Um, you know, address the, you know, the, the big question first. What's its part in the in the in the climate crisis? Um, is it a big part? Um, and what what can you know companies such as yours? play in making it more of a, a sustainable future yeah absolutely well you know lee it's a it's an interesting one because it's one that sort of certainly comes up all the time and you know before i had started breeder i actually i grew up on a farm in australia but then i spent four years working in um media advertising technology where i spent a yeah. lot of time in la new york london and so very different to being on a farm and very different to being on a ranch in america just you know different opinions in, in a lot of ways. And, you know, when I was doing that, you know, one of the reasons I started Breeder is I heard a lot of things, well, you know, meat's bad, no one's going to be eating meat in the next 10 years. Um, everyone's going to be eating alternative proteins and everything else. Yeah. It was, you know, that was peak hype cycle for the alternative protein. And, you know, I think what's been really interesting is that, you know, as that's matured and as it's come through, even at that time, the, the meat and beef industry especially was continuing to grow so you know the yeah. world had believed that it was declining and it was all over but actually it continued to grow and it's because there's a few things about the meat industry the meat industry it is one of those aspirational products so when you start to think about global meat intake you know europe's had it for a while and america's been having it the whole the whole you know the centuries decades millennia yeah. you know yeah. that go through but when it comes to Asian markets like China, red meat especially is something that hasn't been part of the diet and is becoming part of the diet. So you have this dynamic where actually the red meat industry is growing. And, you know, what we're we're seeing now is actually, and you know, there's been a pullback on alternative proteins. So I'm sure people have looked at various share prices of people that have been in that in that sector. And, you know, with the retailers and the consumers we're dealing with is that people are realizing that meat and red meat especially is incredibly nutritious, natural, yeah. you know, doesn't have a lot of preservatives in it, doesn't have a lot of additives and chemicals yeah. that have been put into it. Um, and, you know, with that, you know, there is certainly, you know, the counter that there is a challenge on the environment, you know, depending on what report you looked at, I think, you know, at one stage there was a report that was released by the UN that said meat was worse than automotive. Um, now that, proved to be untrue and was mm -hmm. redacted by the people that wrote that. Um, but it was something that got into the world. And, you know, the reason it was untrue is that when they did automotive, they only counted the emissions out of the cars and not the manufacture of the car. Where when they did beef, they didn't count just the processing of the beef. They counted, you know, the full supply chain. And, yeah, and yeah, so, yeah. you know, when you actually compared it, you know, beef turned out to be about 10% of what automotive was. But still an emitter it's still you know agriculture in total is 13 14 percent of global emissions um but of that you know 50 percent of it um is coming from meat production the other 50 yeah. comes from you know the production of arable foods and crops and and stuff like that um, and then a big part of it is um, a big part of the what's attributed to red meat is actually deforestation which is certain regions um and so you do have deforestation still in england but you know a lot of that's not attributable to meat anymore like it used to be um but you know you go to brazil and a big portion of deforestation is attributed to meat production and okay um and that is what drives a lot of the challenges now methane is still an issue i'm not shying away yeah, from that no. issue. um and i'll get on to you know why we founded breeder but you know, there you have this global sort of imbalance. And actually, when you look at British beef, incredibly, um, like, I wouldn't say it's amazing for the environment, but it is way better than a lot of production cycles. In fact, if you look at emissions out of a kilogram of beef, ooh, um, 
a lot of that, the worst production is in sort of Brazil because of deforestation, but the US and the UK are actually some of the better production in terms of a kilogram of beef. So if you're going to eat, eat local, it, it'd be what I'd say. Um, okay. So, and then, I think, you know, I, we can get into why I found a breeder in a second, but it's, there is a lot of opportunity to drive efficiency within that sector as well. Interesting. So, yeah, so, so, so tell us a little bit about breeder then. What, what's the, you know, what's the mission? What's the problem that you're solving? Yeah. So, I mean, grow up on a farm, spend a lot yeah. of time in supply chains, um, and, you know, I saw sort of four or five years ago, I saw this challenge where farmers were planting trees, they were looking after their soils, they were doing it, and they were friends and family of mine in both England and Australia, and I had family in the US, and yet they were getting ridiculed terribly for producing food, you know, and it was a really, it was almost heartbreaking, like you'd yeah. see the people producing animals which they cared for and reared, and yes, they got killed at the end to produce meat, but like, they the love and care that goes into production um, was then just being ridiculed. So a big part of breeder was like, well, how do we build and supply chains? Because you speak to these ranchers that are just, or farmers, because I'm in America at the moment, um, and they say, trust me, look, I am doing this, just trust me. But in this day and age, people want data. They want an understanding of what's happening. They want people to be able to prove what they're doing. And so I sort of saw an opportunity for breeder to really work with farmers and producers to be able to help capture better data, help understand where the efficiency gains can be made to improve the environment, help okay. understand, you know, how farmers can make more money. They are, beef production in the UK is actually a loss making business in a lot of areas because it's, really without right. subsidy, it's wow. very hard to make money on average um, out of it. Uh, and, you know, that's due to the prices that are being paid, you know, and that's consumers still expect cheap mints, cheap beef. You know, it's a key part of the diet. In fact, through COVID beef consumption for the first six months of 2020 went up something like 15 percent um, because that's what people knew how to cook. So it's a very it's a very important part of the British diet and the, the global diet. Um, so breed is really this data platform that helps ranchers understand their own animals. So what we've done is a lot of farms were sort of uh, globally were looking at animals on like the average of 100 in a herd or something like that. We individually then look at those animals. Then not only do we individually look at where they've been and the traceability, but we look at the production performance, the health, the welfare. And then we track those animals as they move farm to farm. Because the thing a lot of people don't know about beef also is it's not just one farmer growing an animal. These far animals actually move two or three farms through the supply chain. And it makes that whole understanding of like emissions and capture and everything else really complicated. And so, you know, it's we then use that data to put machine learning and AI. And actually, given this is a systems problem, um, it's a really applicable to you know, large language models and AI and, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. We started using neural networks four years ago to help build better prediction models around, you know, which animals are good, which have had challenges, you know, how do we, how do we improve for the future? So uh, effectively then for the farmer, it makes their processes more efficient. So yeah. those efficiencies are passed down into, you know, profit. Yeah, so profit and emissions. So, you know, if you have if you have an animal that is unwell, not taken care of, slow growing, yeah. actually emits a lot more methane than one that's really well cared for. No, it doesn't it? Right. Good genetics, um, you know, loved in so many ways, given the that's right amount of feed at the right time. So, you know, we help track the animal for the consumer, but we also help the production efficiency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How we do that. And and this whole industry, what's really exciting is you can treat your animals better. You can have greater growth rates and better performance, which drives more profit. But both of those together create a more sustainable and less emissions. So it's a win, win, win. Yeah. If we do this well, and that's the target of breeder is, is helping along all those lines. It's interesting what you said about um the, the, the cattle not just being on one farm and I think when, when we spoke the first time you know I'm, I'm from Cumbria which is a big farming region in the UK and um, a, a good friend of mine a number of friends of mine are farmers also 
and and he was traveling out to Denmark to go and buy cattle and bring them back to his farm. So that's an example of what you were saying of, of cows not just staying on one farm. Yeah, um, and and you know that's it's a complex system. Like depending yeah. on what genetics you're using, what feed they have, how well you've cared for them, what their health and welfare is. You know, all of these influence um, the quality of the meat, yeah. but also the the efficiency of the meat that comes out the back of the supply chain so but it's you know these animals also have a huge benefit to the arable market which is you know in farming terms that's producing your grains and your beans and your crops and all of that sort of stuff because they also produce fertilizer so their manure can then be used for fertilizer where a lot of those crops are grown with synthetic fertilizers which come from the oil and gas industry at the moment so like the best system is a holistic system where you're actually encompassing animals into that supply chain because they also eat a lot of food waste. I think 40 when you speak to the read UN reports, 40 percent of food is wasted globally. Like that is a huge number in developed oh, yeah. countries. Criminal. And that food waste can actually go back into food supply chains and it can go back into things like animals, which can eat that food waste, which produce meat and produce fertilizer and produce a lot of these and do upcycling from something that you know is effectively a consumer issue where you've got 40 percent of this food being wasted yeah really interesting stuff um so ian you, you set up i think it was 2018 you've had some good success you've had a, a a good raise recently i think it was nine million um and then you've just as you say i think you're based out of austin now so you're in the us so it's it's going well clearly, um, but usually with startups, there's not always the plain sailing. Tell us a little bit more about your, about your challenges and how yeah, you're able to to get around you know, those. Everyone wishes it plain sailing, and everyone yeah, hears yeah, of the best things, obviously <laughs> that are plain sailing. But you know, I think for us, we're developing technology that you know. 10 years ago, not a lot of farmers had an iPhone in their pocket. And, you know, five years ago, that iPhone couldn't get network connectivity across most of the farm that you'd be working on. And so you had to be able to develop software that worked in like a raining environment that was practical. You know, if you've got a 600 kilogram animal that you're dealing with and your phone doesn't work, that phone's not going to last very long. You're going to get pretty frustrated. So (laughs) it was a very interesting start because we had to develop software in environments that hadn't been developed before. And so lots of learning, lots of up and downs, a few broken phones, but you know, you you take that as learnings and and you move on. And, And I think what's been really interesting for us is in some ways, the awareness of the food supply chain. When we started out, it was farmers are bad, farmers are bad. What that's driven four years later, five years later, is an awareness of food supply chains and this need for people to want to track supply chain. So we've evolved from being just a data company to now being a supply chain company where we actually, instead of just helping the rancher, we help those ranchers get together and build better supply chains, collaborate, give data feedback, and provide something that consumers want. and. And we now see significant growth across US, Australia, UK, where people are wanting to have that visibility of those supply chains. They're wanting to have a story that they can take to consumers. And, you know, that started because of the ridicule that was going to the farmers. But I think consumers, people don't give consumers enough credit. You know, what that meant for them is actually let's start investigating the supply chain. Oh, maybe some of these alternatives aren't that healthy for me. Okay, then how do I, th- maybe all beef isn't bad, like there is good beef out there that they could go for. So I think, you know, it's been interesting. And I think the more people look into this, the more people get to understand it, you know, the more transparency we offer, it's actually driving consumption to a, a way that, and it's definitely not, you know, us versus them in my mind. It is from like an alternative protein side, it's definitely us versus them. But like yeah. from my side, global protein consumption is due to grow by 70 to 80 percent in the next 10 years there physically isn't enough farmland to do that right so we need alternatives we need ways for that to take up some forms of the diet you know because of growth in meat consumption in africa and asia this is a how do we work together to solve this problem and i think i get frustrated on you know the one versus the other because it's just It's not the case. Everyone should have a bit of meat in their diet. In fact, you know, there's studies out now for 
you know, children, the iron and everything of how important it is for brain development. Like you really need meat as part of your diet. I think it's 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 been very easy for people to form opinions because, you know, once the, the media get hold of something and it, it spirals out of control with the sensationalism and whatnot, isn't it? And then, you know, <laughs> companies like Netflix get hold of stuff like that. And, you know, next thing you've got documentaries that are going out and that sort of stuff. It's easy for people to form opinions without actually knowing the facts and the and the figures behind it, which is why it's been interesting having someone like yourself on that actually knows um, the background. Um, what's what's next? You're, you're in, you're in yeah. the US, obviously. Um, anything exciting that you can share with us? Yeah, so look, we, we're constantly working on how we can think about making this better for everyone in the supply chain, consumers included. You know, how do we build better produce? How do we build it better? Um, we're seeing a lot of fragmentation now. So like tracking supply chains for fully grass-fed versus grain-fed, because grain-fed is still a big part of the US diet. You know, hormone-free, which is a US thing, which a lot of that gets exported to Europe. Um, Antibiotic-free, like... There is demand for specific types of meat. So you've got higher consumers going with it. From a breeder perspective, you know, a lot of focus on Australia, US, North America, um, and the UK. Really, for us, we're looking at ways that we can start to encompass into our data tracking things that reduce methane through the supply chain. So we're working on projects to look at what can be done. Is that methane inhibitors? Is it better genetics? Like, how do we improve our supply chains to be able to continue because a lot of the retailers we work with who, who are, have goals to reduce emissions by 30 to 50 percent and they're really really passionate about it like they want to hit those targets and yeah you know that that means constant improvement um that goes with it and i think you know we we just see a lot of opportunity to work with people like people this is a people business and you know how do we work with people and how do we help articulate the stories of those people but then you know, we're becoming more and more an education platform of like, how do you help them work with those people to get better? And yes, it helps them make more money. That's the whole. Do you, do you think that, you know, it's, it's, it's very much UK, US, Australia at the moment. Do yeah. you think that you will move into some of the developing countries as well that are starting to get beef into their diet? Yeah, so I think definitely. I mean, China buys a lot from the US and Australia and places okay. like that. So and Brazil. Um, there's definitely big opportunities in places like Brazil. That Brazil is changing a lot now because Europe's putting restrictions on meat that can come from Brazil due to deforestation, and okay. so there is a there is a changing environment over there towards supply chains. And I think so. There, there's some really exciting things that are that are coming in this industry, and you know, but and that will deliver a better product in the end. Um, so, but I think for us, you know, we're still a team of 25 people. Um, you know, we're doing well, we're doing it in some of the biggest markets now in, in the world for um, animal production. And, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to sort of do this really, really well. And I'm very focused on doing what we're doing now well, and then from there, you know, taking that elsewhere as we're ready. Love it. Ian, it's all we've got time for. I really appreciate you coming on and, and uh, sharing your insights. It's um, it's something that a lot of people would like to know more about, I think. So um, thanks for sharing. Ian Will from Breeder. Thanks very much. Thank you, Lee.